know, Josh, I'm just glad I got that call this morning from the color coordinator, Church Vineyard color coordinator, said, wear peach today. I was just so glad I'm in. It's really cool here, so it's nice. <laughs> Man, peach is in today. Wow. Well, good to see everybody here this morning. So um, in a few weeks, uh, Sunday, August the 4th, we're going to have a special service on that Sunday because on Sunday, August the 4th, I'll be celebrating my 40th anniversary of the day I got saved 40 years ago, Sunday, August the 4th. So, so uh, I don't know, I'm just excited that I'm still serving Jesus, and it's been 40 great years. So I thought what I would do on that Sunday is just share my testimony, how I got saved hitchhiking around the country, and how I was a little bit insane, and now I've become more insane, but God somehow keeps me going strong. But I'm going to give my testimony on that Sunday and just share, you know, some of the things I've learned on my journey with Christ. So hope you'll be here. And then also, I've been working on a really special project that we'll be talking about on that Sunday. So you want to be here. And then I would just encourage you, if you do have your, your uh, smartphone, bring it, because that morning I'm going to have you go on the internet and find something, and we'll just be talking about it. So it should be a fun Sunday. Plan to be here August the 4th, celebrating 40 years of God saving my life, for which I am eternally happy. So anyway, uh, two men were talking about prayer, and um, one guy makes this comment that he knows how to pray, and the other guy says, yeah, you're so religious. He goes, I'll bet you 10 bucks you couldn't even say the Lord's Prayer. He says, you're on, man. Bows his head. Now I lay me down to sleep. To the Lord, my soul, I pray to keep. If I die before I wake, take my soul or something like that. My soul, I hope you take. The guy goes, wow, man, that is impressive. Here's the 10 bucks. I didn't know you knew the Lord's Prayer. Now, that is funny, but it's kind of got some truth to it. You know, as the church goes, uh, lately it seems like a lot of people growing up in the church don't know the Lord's Prayer. It is amazing that so many people ha don't know how to pray the Lord's Prayer. And, uh, but for, for those that do know it, you know what I'm talking about when I say it is a special prayer. It's something hopefully that gets ingrained in you as a child and, and it just comes out throughout your life. It, uh, it's amazing when you hear the story of the uh, plane that went down during the 9-11 attack. Todd Beamer, if you heard the story, these were the guys that were up in that plane that decided to fight against the terrorists, and he was talking to the operator, and the very last thing he said to the operator, he said, pray the Lord's Prayer with me. And she prayed the Lord's Prayer with them, and he hung up, and they fought the terrorists, and actually cracked, the plane ended up crashing because they couldn't steer it. But there's just something about the Lord's Prayer. It comes out when you're, uh, you know, when you're in need or something, it becomes a part of you. So today we're starting a series on the Lord's Prayer. I'm calling it the One Minute Prayer. It's important you get this concept. This is a one minute prayer. Actually, it's less than a minute. You can pray this prayer in one minute. It's 66 words. And there's something powerful about this that we're going to be spending the next several weeks as we study it. But, but this is a part of what we refer to as devotional prayer, or should be a part of what we refer to as devotional prayer. There's really two basic types of prayer when it comes to prayer. There is what we call thought prayer. Thought prayer is what you experience as you go through life. Uh, throughout the day, one sentence, uh, several words, God help me, please give me wisdom, God help that person. Thank you for this, thank you for that, love you Jesus. Those are thought prayers, and actually those are evidence of a relationship with God. If you go day after day, week after week, and you look at your life and you have no thought prayers, uh, it would be fair to say maybe there's not a relationship there. It'd be like saying, I'm married to my wife and we haven't talked in weeks. It'd be like, mm, that's just not good. There should, be, there should be conversation that's going on. And actually that's probably where most Christians live is thought prayer. Uh, you could not say, realistically, you have a relationship with God if you don't have any kind of thought prayer throughout the day, day after day, week after week. But there's another kind of prayer, and it's called devotional prayer. Devotional prayer is where you set aside some time, you quiet yourself down, you stop what you're doing, and you dedicate that to God. And really, for most Christians, that is difficult. Uh, is very, very difficult. But here's the thing, and this is just truth. The fact is you can have a relationship with God without devotional prayer. Uh, it, but 
without devotional prayer, your spiritual maturity level will never reach its, its true height where it's supposed to be. You'll, you'll never enter into realms of supernatural. Uh, you'll, you'll struggle with hearing the voice of God. But you can have a relationship with God without devotional prayer. It's not recommended. But, but in fact, when it comes to devotional prayer, I think it's fair to say most Christians have ADD. Is that right? ADD. Most Christians struggle with ADD when it comes to retention deficit disorder. You sit down to pray, and you pray about 20 seconds, and what happens? You're distracted, your mind's wandering, you can't settle down, it's like, I gotta go. Man, it's only been 20 seconds, uh, you know. But, but what we want to take a look at is this is where I believe the Lord's Prayer can be helpful. It can, it can settle you down a little bit, it can give you some direction and kind of help you in your growth and understanding of devotional prayer. Now, now, learning about prayer or hearing a sermon about prayer uh, and, and expecting you to know how to pray is sort of like telling you this morning how to, ca- how to fly cast and how to catch fish on the river. I could tell you and you can have information in your head, but until you get out on the river and do it, you, you don't really know what it's about. And it's pretty much like that with devotional prayer. Until you actually try to take some of this and, and practice it and work it out, it, it's going to be difficult. But our hope is, as we take the next several weeks and go through this, that, that your devotional prayer will actually begin to grow and blossom and become real and a part of your life. So we're going to be reading in the Gospel of Matthew this morning. Before we do, let's take a minute and honor the Word of God. So if you have your Bibles electronic or paper. Let's hold them up. Let's say this together. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 4. What an awesome statement Jesus said. We have to realize, folks, we are three parts. We are a spirit. We live in a body. We have a soul or a mind. Most people know that you need to feed your body you don't feed your body day after day, day after day, what's going to happen to your strength? You're going to get weak. If you don't exercise and feed your mind, if you watch TV all the time and that's your exercise, what kind of brain are you going to have? Jello. You know, it'll be weak. You You have to feed your body. You have to feed your mind, your intellect. What about your spirit? Jesus is saying... The Bible, the Word of God, is food for your spirit. If you want to be a strong spiritual person, feed your spirit. That's why we read the Word on Sunday and encourage you. There's bread, food for the spirit right here as we read the Word. All right, let's take a minute and have a quick text poll this morning. So we're talking about prayer. So I'm just curious, how many of you, when you go out to eat, do you pray in restaurants? Yes, I do. No, I don't. Sometimes, what are you talking about? You know, what is... What is this thing about praying in restaurants? Many years ago, I found a uh, Norman Rockwell picture that became one of my favorite pictures. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but uh, this is a Norman Rockwell picture. He was a painter for the Saturday Evening Post, but it's a picture of a grandmother and her grandson praying at a restaurant. And notice everybody around going, what is that? What is she doing? I think today, though, when you pray, if you pray in a restaurant, probably you would get that look and then someone would sue you for offending them. You know, it's the kind of country we're living in now, you know. You can't do that. That offends me. I'm just pre- silent. You're offending me, man, you know. But I would encourage you. I think it's good to pray when you go to a restaurant. But I wouldn't do it for show. Maybe challenge yourself. If you pray at home, then, yeah, pray in a restaurant. If you never pray at home, then probably not smart to be praying in a restaurant to show off. But I think that um, praying before meals is, is a good thing to do. I grew up doing that as a child. My dad... We had meal, dinner every night, and uh, man, we didn't only pray before we ate, we had to pray after we ate. It was like we, we couldn't leave the table until we had an ending prayer. We had a beginning prayer and an ending prayer. But um, I, I know with our children, we used our dinner prayer as our devotion. And actually, that's where we taught our children how to pray the Lord's Prayer. So we would pray for dinner, and our dinner prayer would be the Lord's Prayer. We did that for many years, and you know, try to make it exciting or something. I told them that as we prayed it, as we got to the end, they could get louder and louder. There's something cool about that. So like we'd be praying and be, and for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. We'd be shouting it. And then one day Roxanne said, I don't know if that's good. You know, I said, no, it's good, man. They're learning the Lord's prayer. You know? so, but um, I, I, think praying, I think praying in restaurants is a good thing. And if you do it, don't be ashamed. You know, honor God. 
But how do we do here? Wow, 55% pray in restaurants, 9% don't, about 36%. I, I would say for me, I'm probably in the 75% of the time when I go to restaurants. You know, one thing that I like to do, and we'll be talking about prayer, and actually something I, I really feel inspired by the Holy Spirit to kind of institute in our church for a while is whenever um, we pray at home, I always make sure everybody holds hands because there's something I don't know about that that I just feel like it helps you to connect. So I was thinking, at the end of our service, maybe from now on, or at least for a while, when we say, let's pray, let's just grab somebody's hand. Let's, let's start holding hands. There's something about praying with people, connecting. It's connecting with God, but it's connecting with people, and that's the summary of the whole Bible. Just do me a favor, don't go across the aisle so we don't block the ushers coming through. But anyway, it's a good thing to pray. Let's take a look at what Jesus had to say about prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And we'll start reading in verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. You just want to yell that. I don't know. There's just, just a momentum builds up there forever. Amen. Um, in, this prayer is found in the Gospel of Matthew. It's also found in the Gospel of Luke. But uh, this is something where uh, many, again, many people have learned this as children and have memorized it. And again, I would encourage every mom and dad to make sure your children know this prayer. Probably the Lord's Prayer and maybe uh, Psalm 23 would be the two most common passages of Bible that people are familiar with, uh, prayed and quoted many, many times throughout life. And um, I, I was just trying to get a count how many times I might have prayed the Lord's Prayer in my life so far. I'm sure I've prayed this prayer somewhere upwards of 10,000 times in my life. And uh, it's, it, there's something, again, about it. It's special. It doesn't lose its touch. It, again, it's a short prayer, but there are truths in this prayer that Jesus wanted his disciples to know that I believe if you get the revelation and you begin to pray this with understanding, it really will help you in your relationship with God. And if anything, it will correct some misconceptions that people have of God. One of the biggest things that hinders people in their relationship with God is they, they see God the wrong way. And I think the devil constantly tries to do that, distort our view of God. This, this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, will help clear that up and make it so we have a better understanding. It's revolutionary. This prayer was truly revolutionary when he taught it to disciples. Now, it's not here in the Gospel of Matthew, but if you turn to the Gospel of Luke where he said this prayer, actually what instituted this prayer, what brought it about, was the disciples asking Jesus to teach them to pray. It's really amazing to me that these men would be traveling with Jesus for upwards to a year or so, and they're watching Jesus in his prayer life, and at some point they say to him, Jesus, could you teach us how to pray? I find this interesting because uh, they obviously struggled with prayer. I think they were talking about this concept of settling yourself down devotional prayer, not so much thought prayer. But this, this hunger to pray is birthed in everybody's heart. It's put there by God. We all want to pray. And if you ever want someone to feel bad, you can just say to them, do you pray enough? And what's the answer? No. No one ever prays enough. People always feel bad about that. It's not that we're supposed to feel bad. It just means there's a hunger there. And I don't believe it'll ever be fully met until we enter the presence of God and have eternal fellowship with Him. But this hunger, it's amazing. It's universal. You know, if you go on Amazon and just type in the word prayer, there's over 8,000 books listed in Amazon on how to pray. 8,000 books telling us that people are hungry. But I think one of the problems when it comes to devotional prayer is that Christians especially have a, have a uh, I would call it a wrong view of devotional prayer. Most Christians feel like devotional prayer should be long, it should be hard, you should be kneeling, it should be 5 o'clock in the morning. 
I mean, this is, you know, people, this is the, when you say devotional prayer, this is what most people think. Well, now think about this. This is what Jesus said about devotional prayer. The first thing is, it doesn't have to be long. He gives a prayer 66 words. When you pray, 66 words, less than a minute. I, I know some of you are sitting here right now thinking, no, that's not enough. That's not, that doesn't count. It has to be an hour. I have to be kneeling on broken glass. and <laughs> The temperature has to be off. I have to be free. I mean, it's just this weird view we have of devotional prayer. Because of that, many of us don't ever really develop devotional prayer. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be long. As a matter of fact, it can be nice. It can be easy. It can be a good experience. That's what it's supposed to be. So if getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning and having a quiet time doesn't work for you, don't do it. Find something else. Maybe a one-minute break at lunch. Maybe a walk in the park. Maybe on your way to work in the morning, your devotional time could be that quiet time. Turn the radio off. Find something that works for you and don't make it long and arduous and difficult and, and something you don't want to do. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Now, now, I think the prayer can be prayed exactly as Jesus said it. You can say the 66 words, say them from your heart. God will use it in your life. I think also the 66 words can also be used like an outline for prayer. In other words, you can pray one line and then stop and just think about it and meditate on that, and maybe that's as far as you get. Maybe you pray two lines. Maybe one line jumps out at you. It's sort of like a template, like, like if you go into your word processor and you say, I want to uh, print out a certificate, an award certificate. The, the template comes out, but you have to fill it in. You have to put your date, person's name, you know, the specific information. I, I think the Lord's Prayer can be like a template for prayer. It'll give you direction because sometimes the difficulty in devotional prayer is I don't know what to pray about. And I don't want to be weird and just read off a list. I think that's offensive. I want to talk to God. And so here's Jesus saying, look, when you pray, guys, ladies, it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be long. It can be a nice experience. It can be short. Your devotional prayer to God is acceptable if it's one minute or less. Grab a hold of that if you want to get any truth. Start with that. Now, it's likely it will go longer, but it's not so much that that's what makes it acceptable. It's just like if you're visiting with someone and you're talking and you're enjoying the conversation and you talk for 15 minutes or a half an hour or an hour. Not because you have to, it's because you're enjoying the conversation. I think devotional prayer sometimes goes longer, but it's not what makes it devotional prayer. Jesus said 66 words. And he starts out with this statement, Our Father... I like the old King James, which art in heaven, but I know that's sort of strange. All the new translations read, Our Father in heaven, but I can't help it when I pray. I say, Our Father, which art in heaven. But this concept of calling God his Father was truly revolutionary. Jesus referred to God as his Father many times while he was on the earth. In the New Testament, there are 70 references to God as your Father. This was revolutionary, maybe not so much to us today, but it was revolutionary in Jesus' day. And really, probably for many people, it's still revolutionary. It, it was offensive to the Jewish people in this day because they referred to God as a creator, as the Lord, as the master. They used the word Yahweh, but they wouldn't even say Yahweh. They, they were afraid to because they feared God in somewhat in an unhealthy way. They, they didn't understand this concept of relationship. And so here comes Jesus, and he says, Father, when you talk to God, call him your Father. And again, the Jewish people just freaked out about this because they said, you're, you're way too intimate with God. You don't call him your Father. That was just something they couldn't grasp. But what Jesus is saying, when you talk to God, you don't have to refer to him as your boss your dictator, your manager. When you talk to God, he's not some anonymous force up there, something you can't touch. He, he's not uh, nature. 
What he's saying is when you talk to God, you talk to him as your father. You talk directly to him. You don't have to go through saints. You don't have to go through angels. You talk to him as your father. He is your father. Now, now sometimes I realize when you say to people, you ought to talk to God as your father, that kind of awakens some maybe bad feelings. Fact is, a lot of people have grown up in homes where maybe they didn't get along with their father. Maybe some of you are still struggling with that today. Maybe you grew up in a home where you didn't have a father. He deserted the family. Or maybe you had a father who was uh, abusive. Or, or uh, maybe worse yet, maybe he was an alcoholic or something. And so, you know, this, this concept of father upsets people. And I, I think probably most fathers don't really grasp the, the significance of the, the impact we have. We shape the view that our children have of God, especially in the young years. As a matter of fact, pretty much, dads, you're the image of God when they're young. And so a good father makes the uh, trust and the ability to relate to God as your father much easier. A bad dad causes a child quite often to transfer those bad feelings towards God because they look at him as a father. Whether they grasp it or not, it's just a natural transition. And, and our, our relationship with God is, is conditioned by the relationship we have with our father. And so this is kind of interesting to me because if I was around in Jesus' day, I would have said to Jesus, you know, maybe it's not a good idea to call God your father. You know, a lot of people are not going to respond. Why don't you call God your buddy or your friend or something? <laughs> he would have said, get behind me, devil. Like Peter, always giving Jesus suggestions. Well, he knew what he was talking about. He knew, Jesus knew in his day as much as in our day that calling God your father would awaken things within people. But he really, it came naturally to him because that was his relationship with God. His relationship with God, God was his father. He couldn't do anything other than to call him his father. But if we're going to go anywhere with this prayer, we have to get this first piece taken care of. We have to deal with these feelings we have toward our dads, some of them good, some of them bad. And we have to, at some point, learn to forgive our dads let them go, release them so that we can move on and begin to understand there's something here that Jesus was trying to teach when he called God his father. And that simply is this, only God as your father could ever meet all the expectations you have of your dad. Now, this is something we really have to process through. And the sooner you figure this out, the better your relationship with God will be. We want a God who is, uh, we, we want dads, as we're growing up, we want our dads to be someone who shows unconditional love. We want our dads who uh, are, are rooting for our success. And so we have these expectations of our earthly dads. Those expectations are put there by God. The problem is we become unrealistic in our expectations and we really expect our dads to meet every need that we really have. And when they don't, we begin to develop bad feelings. God put those expectations in our heart so that at some point we begin to realize no man could ever meet all those needs. No man, good, the best father on the earth is going to fall short. And at some point, you as the child have to begin to realize, oh, the expectation I have is good and healthy and real. The problem I have is I'm expecting that from a mere mortal who is a sinner like me. And in his best state, he won't even come close to meeting those needs. And then begin to say, God is my father. So when I have these expectations that God will always love me, or my father will always love me, I, I can get what I can get from my earthly father, but where he falls short, I begin to realize my heavenly father is there. When I say I expect my father to encourage me and, and to understand me, 
I, I can get some of that from my dad if I can, but ultimately it's only going to be my heavenly father. When I expect of my father to give me direction or, or to my, you know, when you're younger, you expect your dad to know everything and, and you have these expectations. And again, depending on your dad, maybe he met some of them, but there's no way he can fulfill all of them. Jesus is saying here, call God your father. Call him your father so that you understand those expectations, those needs you have are put there by God and begin to relate to God and allow him to be your father. He can do it. He won't let you down. He will not desert you. He will always support you. He'll be there. He'll encourage you. He understands you. He has time for you. You're important to him. If he had a refrigerator in heaven, your picture would be on his refrigerator. You're his child. And he longs for this kind of relationship. But so many of us, because we're stuck with this, my dad didn't do my dad was like, and we continually harp on this, and, and we don't ever get past it. Well, what we have to understand when we get to heaven, your dad will not be your dad. He won't be. Your mom will not be your mom. We will be brothers and sisters. Your dad did not give you life. God did. And when we get to heaven, you relate to God as your father. And you relate to everybody else as brother and sister. And hopefully before then, but if not before then, at least at that point you get the revelation. Oh, God is my father. God meets those needs. It's not, get, get this point clear. It's not to say you should not have those expectations of a father. You should. They're birthed by God. But what we have to understand is we need to lean on God as our father to meet those expectations, and he will. The sooner you allow your dad to be released from these unrealistic expectations, the healthier you will be in your relationship with God. This is why Jesus started the entire prayer with our father. He's your dad. Paul even said in one letter he wrote to the Romans, it's even more intimate than father. He said, you call him Abba by the spirit, and Abba means dad. It's not disrespectful, it's, a, it's an intimate term where you begin to realize we have a relationship. I believe there is no other religion on the earth that teaches this. I think this is what makes Christianity unique. It's the offer that God, as your father, is interested in your life. Every part of it. You're not, you're not a distraction. You, you are the apple of his eye. He's got time for you. This is what makes, I believe, Christianity unique. And this is why I believe it's the true religion, because it presents God in the right light. He created you that you might have relationship with him. And Jesus, in teaching the disciples, said, when you pray, call God your father. When you think of prayer, don't think of it as a meeting you have to have with God. Do not make it formal. Don't read off a list of things. Sit down. If it's one minute, just talk to him for a minute and move on. But if you enjoy the minute, you might spend five, you might spend ten. But, but get an understanding here. Devotional time, we're talking about devotional prayer, does not have to be difficult. It does not have to be long. But it should be intimate. It should be a conversation you have with God. Over the next several weeks, we're going to continue to work our way through this. My prayer and hope is that you grow in your relationship with God through your prayer. Let's pray. Why don't we do this? Why don't you all stand up? I don't think we'll start doing this for a while. Just grab somebody's hand right next to you. When we pray, it's not only are we having communion with God, but we really join in with God's family, and there's something special about being a part of God's family. So maybe for the next several weeks or something until God shows us otherwise. And we pray, let's, let's just grab somebody's hand. So God, as our Father, we are so grateful that you reveal yourself as a Father. And I pray, God, as our Father, we, we understand the expectations we have of our fathers are put there by you. 
And we're thankful for our dads. We thank you for all they do. But, but God, we understand now that they can't, they just can't measure up to the incredible expectations we all have. But you can. You are our Father. When we, we want to be understood, when we want to be accepted, when we, we need wisdom and we need guidance and we need strength and support, Father, I pray that we learn to look to you and begin to open our understanding of devotional time. Father, that it's not difficult and hard and something we have to do and long. It can be short. It can be easy. It can be sweet. It can be something we enjoy. And that we look at it as, as a conversation, not as a meeting. And I pray that our, our devotional life for each person here would grow. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we have our ushers come forward? We're going to take our offering. sense as Josh was leading us in worship that there really is somebody here who's praying that prayer today. Somebody somebody here is in a desperate situation. I mean, you're at your wit's end and you're praying this prayer today. Jesus, I need you. I just sense the Holy Spirit wants to meet you. Wants to meet you in your need today. Who, who's, who am I speaking to? Is somebody, somebody here in a desperate situation? Okay. If some of the people around him right here, if you guys could just get around him right there, we're just going to pray. Anybody else in a, in a real tight situation really need God? All the way in the back here, there's a hand right here. Some of you people turn around right here. Hold your hand up, ma'am. Just, just get, let's pray with her all the way in the back here, right here. This brother's got his hand up. Just, let's just get by these people who have their hands up. I really sense the Holy Spirit saying, today he's going to touch you. You're in a tough situation. You need divine intervention. If you need specific prayer this morning, you're praying this prayer that the song that Josh is singing, Jesus, I need you. and I, I really need you. Today, help. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to touch you this morning. If, uh, if you're on the prayer team and you're not praying with these, would you, can we have some of our prayer team people come up front here? Just as we get ready to dismiss, a couple of other words came to my heart and mind as I was worshiping here this morning. I got this sense somebody's dealing with some dizzy spells. Uh, you're really having some problems, dizzy spells, and also inflammation in the in the hand. I got, I got this right hand and shoulder. So uh, if I'm talking to you, we want to pray for you this morning. If you have other needs, dealing with situations at home, uh, dealing with situations at work, this is the time where we call upon the Holy Spirit to specifically speak to you and deal with your situations. So we're going we're gonna to close in prayer. I'm just going to pray over all these people that had their hands raised, but those of you that are around them, and I just encourage you, listen to the Holy Spirit. God may speak something to your heart. Speak it to them. I, I feel like the Holy Spirit wants to speak to them directly today. So let's close in prayer. Father, I pray for each one of these people that raised their hand today. I just got this sense there was some desperation. And they're crying out to you, God help me. And Father, we want to be the vessels this morning. God, I pray by your Holy Spirit you touch them in their need right now. If it's a financial need, if it is a physical need, if it's a marriage need, in the name of Jesus break through right now. Speak into their heart, their mind, their situation, God. Help them to realize you are the one who can bring the right resolution. We pray this, God. And we bless them right now in the name of Jesus, God. We thank you for bringing us together here this morning, God. We ask that as you send us out, just help us to be aware of the fact this week, God, that setting a, a, a minute aside just to call you our Father can make a difference in our lives. Bless us at work. Bless us with our friends, our families, our neighbors, God. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
God bless you. If you're newer to the church, right after the service, we're going to take a quick doorway tour of the building. Meet us right in the back with the uh, couches. You're all dismissed. <laughs>